people find that anxiety and pain, for example, compound one another. And if you learn to manage the anxiety, the pain will literally be less. Hypnosis can be a way of um, teaching yourself how to be different and staying different. So the nice thing also is it's a tool. Once you learn it, you've got with you anytime you need it. So some people at the beginning will do self-hypnosis three, four, five times a day. After a while, they may do a daily refresher. It's available if you need it, anytime you need it, anywhere you need it. We've discovered, for example, uh, Sarah, that, that there's a part of the brain where activity goes down in hypnosis. It's called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. It's part of the salience network. It's part of the brain system that tells you if there's a loud noise, <laughs> you better pay attention to it. It derails you from whatever else you're thinking. And in hypnosis, activity in that part of the brain goes down. And part of how it does is that hypnotizable people have more of an inhibitory neurotransmitter called GABA that helps serotonin bind to its receptors. Uh, so we have our own little natural hypnopharmacy in our brain, and we can actually make more of the anti-anxiety uh, neurotransmitters work to reduce our anxiety and stress. So uh, it's a system that once you get it up and running, and you know, we know that neurons that fire together wire together, we call it neuroplasticity, that the more you do that, the better you get at it. So you can really change your brain by changing the way you deal with a problem like pain or stress or habits uh, and that kind of thing. So David, what you just said about anxiety, it was really fascinating. So can you tell me a bit more, actually so our listeners more about this? You can think of anxiety as the fear of fear, that there is this feedback between your worry your body's reaction to the worry, your reaction to your body. And so I teach people how to better manage their anxiety. It's, I don't say don't be afraid. There are, there's plenty of reasons for us to be fearful. But I had a man recently who said my career is being totally ruined because I get anxious in an airplane. And I used to be able to fly. I just can't fly now. And that's ter terribly damaging to my career. So I said, okay, I want you to do three things when you get on the airplane and practice this before go into a state of self-hypnosis, and instead of fighting the plane, float with the plane. Think of it, buckle yourself in, and think of the movement the way you used to enjoy riding on a roller coaster when you were a kid. Just enjoy it, float with the plane. Second, think of the plane as an extension of your body. So you're reconceptualizing what's going on. You're not trapped in a tin can thrown into the air. You're using a mode of transportation like a bicycle. If you want to get from one place to another, you can walk or you can take a bicycle and get there faster. And the pilot is an extension of your brain. You've chosen a good airline that has well-trained pilots and they're controlling it. So you're not out of control, you're in control. And third, think about the difference between a possibility and a probability. It's always possible that the plane will crash, but it isn't probable. And so if you focus on the fact that you can visualize it, not meaning it's likely to happen. And he got back to me uh, a few months later and said, I'm flying again. Thank you. You know, I've got my life back. So people can just learn to control their physical reaction and reconceptualize what's happening in a way that allows them to feel in control and to be in control. That's amazing. I mean, there's a fear of flying is a huge one. For so many people. Yes. It's about 10% of people w who would fly can't because they're too frightened of it. And that's where anxiety becomes actually a completely debilitating life that's situation. Right. That's, actually. that's right. It does. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest things, right? That when I think about mindfulness or even therapy on talking to somebody about and communication around how they're dealing with maybe it's grief or pain and how hypnosis must be, must be working on a completely different area of the brain or something is happening that seems to be entirely different in the approach. How would you, how would you describe it to somebody like me? What we found is going on in the brain. That's one of the things. I'd say you're in a particularly receptive state when you're in a state of hypnosis. So I do psychotherapy too. Um, it can be very helpful to people. But in a state of hypnosis, you're more open and receptive to approaching things from a new point of view. So it, it's more intense. Um, we are changing things in our brain when we do psychotherapy, too. We, you know, we, we learn to be different, and the brain can begin to rewire itself a bit differently. But in hypnosis, you're, 
you're not arguing, you're absorbing, you're listening, you're seeing what would this feel like if I did this? How do I feel right now when I do it? Um, and we find that in 12 minutes, we can get a significant reduction in levels of stress and pain during these hypnosis exercises. So it's rare that you can just feel different, feel better in a hurry with any kind of psychotherapeutic technique. And you can with hypnosis because it's so intense and focused. Wow. 12 minutes. That is quick. I mean, I was complete. I kind of thought, you know, it would be at least an hour before you start seeing these effects. But 12 minutes is is incredibly quick. I mean, that, I guess that's something inc as well. If you're hypnotizable, you'll go straight in. You go straight in. It, you, the hypnotic inductions in reverie are less than a minute. Um, you can just shift gears. You don't. Have, it's not like going to sleep at all. Hypnosis is not sleep. It's a, it's a, a, a wakeful attention. We find you know an average reduction of a point and a half out of ten within twelve minutes. So people can feel different immediately. That's one of the nice things about it. You know whether it's going to help you or not right away, and so it is possible to make yourself feel different in a hurry with hypnosis. Now, David, explain this one to me. So I've only had it done once, okay? Now, I had it quite a few years ago when I went through quite a traumatic breakup. Mm, and sorry. I went to a retreat, and there was a hypnosis person there. Anyway, so a hypnotist said, like, come, let's see if this works on you. Mm -hmm. Now, I just don't remember what happened. I don't I don't remember the experience. Like, I couldn't, I, I couldn't tell you what happened. You know, I mean, she just said you went straight away. But there's that moment of, obviously, I just felt like I went completely unconscious. I obviously wasn't unconscious. I was obviously very conscious and breathing and going through the experience. Is that quite a normal thing? Can people not remember what happens in the experience? Or are you aware the whole way through when you're being hypnotized of what's going on? And can you come back and be able to explain it clearly? Because well, I yeah. think there's like a real misconception around this. There is. Um, I, I, I would be pretty certain that you were aware while it was happening, but... Uh, your access easily to memories of what happened then uh, seems to be less available to you. And in part, it's because there was a shift in context and we need contextual cues to remember things. You know, if, if you go back to the school you went to when you were seven or eight years old you, and you look around, the size of the hall looks different because you're a bigger person now, you start remembering things you know, you, you open a locker and you remember the stuff you had in the locker. Thanks so much for listening. To hear the full episode, there's a link in the description. <laughs>